So welcome to the fourth session of the symposium, 50 years of Project Tiger, conservation, conflict, critique. Earlier today, we had two absolutely brilliant papers by Anu Jalis and Meghna Mehta in a session titled Re-Enchanting the Sundarbans. Our speakers for the present session titled Paper Tigers are Sandhya Volta and Surabhi Goyal. Sandhya Volta is a lecturer in English at the University of Manchester. She's the author of Multispecies Modernity, Disorderly Life in Postcolonial Literature. Her research focuses on multispecies relations across the postcolonial world. Our second speaker, Surabhi Goyal, completed her MPhil from the Department of English, University of Delhi, with distinction. Her MPhil dissertation was titled Apocalypse Dreams, American Frontier Myths in the Anthropocene. Her broad interests include American literature, literary theory, and critical animal studies. Before I invite Sandhya to uh, start her talk to us today, I would just like to mention that we will be keeping everybody's cameras, microphones, and the chat function disabled for the duration of the talk. These will be enabled once we start the Q&A. So over to you, Sandhya. Thank you so much. Um... Let me just start. Is that... <laughs> Sorry, now I can't. Sorry, I need to stop sharing. Sorry. <laughs> um, thank you so much. And thank you for including me in these discussions, which have been so rich and generative. Um, and I hope I'm going to pick up very closely on what we discussed this morning today. Um, so that will be hopefully good. Um, so my talk is called Unwilding the Wild Tiger. Uh, what is the wild? Across a multitude of contemporary discourses, the wild is configured as a space, a category, a refusal of category and action and a way of being. Today, I want to explore this overdetermined concept through the figure of the tiger and the conservation of its wildness through five decades of Project Tiger. With roots in colonial practices of spatial and species domination, Indian conservation has long been simultaneously lauded as a success and decried as, a, as oppressive. As we've been discussing over the course of our conversations, it has been invested in building fortresses to protect its most charismatic icon, a practice that has brought conservation into conflict with diverse groups, but has also, at least purportedly, saved slivers of wild space in which tigers can thrive. But what makes a wild space, and indeed a wild tiger? What good does the category wild do for anyone, of any species amidst the intensity of the current ecological crisis. So I want to start off with two descriptions of the same wild landscape. A mangrove forest is a universe unto itself, utterly unlike other woodlands or jungles. There are no towering vine looped trees, no ferns, no wildflowers, no chattering monkeys or cockatoos. Mangrove leaves are tough and leathery, the branches gnarled and the foliage often impassably dense. Visibility is short and the air is still and fetid. At no moment can human beings have any doubt of the terrain's hostility to their presence, of its cunning and resourcefulness, of its determination to destroy or expel them. Every year, dozens of people perish in the embrace of that dense foliage, killed by tigers, snakes, and crocodiles. There is no prettiness here to invite the stranger in, Yet to the world at large, this archipelago is known as the Sundarbans, which means the beautiful forest. The steamer now made a sharp turn, leaving behind a wide river and entering a creek. It was so narrow that we seemed to be passing through a tunnel inside the forest. The falling tide had lowered the steamer and raised the mangroves above us, so that the channel was now overlooked on both sides by impenetrable battlements of mud and tangled foliage. 
There was scarcely a creature to be seen, but every element of the landscape, forest, water, earth, seemed to be seething with life. So these passages may be familiar. Um, they come from two novels by the Bengali writer Amitabh Ghosh, uh, from books published 15 years apart. And they represent the Sundarbans region of West Bengal and Bangladesh, which was the subject of our discussion this morning. Ghosh is famous for fiction that is meticulously detailed in its attention to underrepresented histories, and also for his groundbreaking consideration of the role in, of literature in responding to climate change, first visited the Sundarbans in his 2004 novel, The Hungry Tide, and returned to it in a quasi-sequel, 2019's Gun Island. Much has been written about The Hungry Tide, uh, including by me, but what we might see as the transition between the two representations, what has changed and also what has stayed the same is I think significant for our discussions here. So a quick sketch for those who aren't familiar with the books. The Hungry Tide tells the tale of two outsiders, an urban cosmopolitan translator and an American marine biologist studying endangered river dolphins as they encounter the Sundarbans through people, landscape and tigers. The book focuses largely on telling the story of the subaltern people of the region and their marginalization in an environment Ghosh represents as already barely survivable, and especially their disenfranchisement by top-down conservation initiatives, namely Project Tiger. Throughout, the tiger is a central figure of fear, threat, power, sublimity, and ultimately transformation, until at the end, the tiger disappears completely and the naughty problem of tiger conservation in the region is displaced onto the much less controversial project of involving local people in the protection of river dolphins. Gun Island returns to the Sundarbans and to some of the same characters to follow historical threads of migration from Bengal to Venice and to put them alongside the journeys of contemporary refugees in the midst of environmental catastrophe. The story of Dean, Gosha's protagonist, is one of journeying it is much less grounded in the Sundarbans than the previous novel, but at the same time, the Sundarbans is the necessary backdrop for the global unfolding of the narrative. While the Sundarbans and its wildness remain important in the second novel, the tiger is absent. The sublime and transformative encounter with the wild, which in The Hungry Tide comes repeatedly in the form of face-to-face -face meetings with tigers, happens in Gun Island with a snake instead. So this moment, of encountering wildness is thematically necessary, but it seems like the tiger isn't. So I wanna think about what this shift might mean in the context of conservation, ideas of wildness and projects of rewilding in the region. So in this morning's panel, we heard from eminent scholars of the Sundarbans, and I want to continue this discussion by taking up the Sundarbans as an imagined place. So this kind of poetics of Project Tiger that has been part of the focus of this symposium. And I want to think about it particularly as a space imagined as epitomizing the wild. Um, apologies if this is going back over some territory we've covered, but in case anyone wasn't here this morning. Um, the Sundarbans is a region of small islands and dense mangrove forest at the northern tip of the Bay of Bengal. This area extends over more than 300,000 acres, straddling the border between Bangladesh and, and West Bengal. Much of this land is protected, so meaning, as we discussed this morning, that human activity and habitation are technically illegal but it is still home to a human population who rely mainly on forest resources such as lumber, honey, and beeswax, as well as fish and crustaceans for subsistence, subsistence and income. Um, the recorded human habitation in the Sundarbans stretches back to the 1200s. It intensified during the colonial period and particularly in the mid 19th century when subaltern people were transported into the region by the state in order to cultivate the land and increase revenues. In a parallel development, sections of the forest began to be reserved in 1875 under the Forest Act, 1865. The principal aims of this reservation were to ensure that any revenues from the forest flowed into colonial coffers and to regulate the activities and movements of the local human population. 
As in other parts of India, this early practice of reservation of land for the use of elites was later turned to the purpose of conservation. The recent history of the Sundarbans has been shaped largely by national and global attention to the region's preservation as a site of ecological importance. It became a Project Tiger Reservation in 1973 and a UNESCO and IUCN World Heritage Site in 1997. And we heard from, from Anu Jale this morning. Um, she observes that the Sundarbans region, quote, has two parallel but segregated histories. She argues that the paucity of historical literature on the human inhabitants of the Sundarbans reflects a widespread fascination with the region's flora and fauna that is so strong as to erase the presence of human beings in the minds of academics and the public at large. One expression of this fascination is that in the main, the Sundarbans is not only conceived of as a place empty of human activity, but also as a space of consummate wildness a wildness that is embodied by its unruly tigers. In the passages from Ghosh's novel, we see a densely alive and threatening landscape, an essential wildness that in the texts characterizes not just the plants and the waters, but also the animals, both human and non-human, that lived enmeshed with this place. Scholars have rightly drawn attention to the problematic representation of subaltern people in the hungry tide. Ghosh returns to this strategy in Gun Island. He describes a local boy, for example, as, quote, at once feral and delicately graceful, like some wild, wary creature that could at any moment take flight. These novels propose a seamlessness in the connection between the Sundarbans and its inhabitants, despite the many difficulties of life in the region and the incursions of modernity, economic, technological, and otherwise. And this connection resides in the ungovernability of place and populations by the outsiders and their systems of knowledge. This ungovernability, as we will see, is central to the construction of wildness itself. The wildness of which, for the hungry tide, the wild tiger is emblematic. As previous speakers have demonstrated so well, the tiger in Project Tiger has never been just a tiger. It has been a biodiversity marker, a symbol of food security, an image of power, both colonial and then national, metaphor for cultural histories and economic futures. This animal, so laden with meaning then, has historically offered a signal opportunity for meaning making toward the support of conservation efforts. But in the Sundarbans, the tigers don't inhabit these meanings very comfortably. At last count in 2022, there were an estimated 101 tigers living in the Sundarbans, although Meghna this morning said 96, which is maybe the more recent um, census. It's the ninth largest population among the existing 53 Project Tiger Reserves. Unlike the tigers of other reserves, however, Sundarbans tigers are most famous for being unusually aggressive towards humans. And as we've discussed, figures for the numbers of attacks are unreliable, they vary widely, and there are many theories about the reasons for the behavior. But what I want to draw attention to is, is more the notoriety at national and global scales of the so-called man-eating wild tigers of the Sundarbans. The relationship between animal, the animal as a figure and the animal as a living creature is exposed very clearly in the Sundarbans, where the tigers don't always live up to their image. They aren't content to stay in the fortress set up by conservation to be managed and surveilled. They aren't part of an idealized nature, a wild that is separate from humanity. Nor can they easily be contained by representations of an ungovernable wild like those that we see in Ghosh's novels. Wildness is obviously a term rich in significance in human culture. Among its definitions are, living in a state of nature, not tame, uncultivated, free and unconfined, insubordinate, violent, and raving. These varied associations and methods of defining and categorizing the opposite of tame suggest desire and fascination as well as fear and revulsion. These definitions show us what a fraught concept the wild is for the human imagination and how overdetermined is the term itself. So the theorist Jack Halberstam offers another way to think about the idea of wildness, 
In his book, Wild Things, he writes that wildness is, quote, a form of disorder that will not submit to rule, a mode of unknowing, a resistant ontology, and a fantasy of life beyond the human. Halberstam associates wildness not with what we typically think of as nature, but rather with a multitude of ways of being that have been constructed as non-normative and therefore as wild. Wildness is thus the domain of queer and racialized subjects, of cyborgs, of anti-colonial struggles, and of disorder broadly conceived. This view offers an important corrective to colonial constructions of wilderness and the natural world that continue to dominate our planetary imagination. In this formulation, the wild is not something that can be kept inviolate, imprisoned in a fortress, apart from the world and thus protected. Rather, the wild is constituted by the crossing of boundaries, by the violation of norms, by the storming of the fences. Though the tiger of Project Tiger is a figure of wild nature rooted in colonial categories, it's something more like Halberstam's wildness that the tigers of the Sunderbunds seem to inhabit. But while I appreciate Halberstam's use of the term and his argument, I wonder if we're well served by an attachment to the category wild, however we redefine it. It seems that Halberstam reinstates wildness as a category that is the absence of a category which again puts it in a negative relation to the not wild and at the mercy of normative practices of definition. To demonstrate the limitations I'm referring to, I wanna to turn now to the idea of rewilding. So where I am in the UK, the idea of rewilding has gained purchase in recent years. We hear of the need to rewild the land and to rewild ourselves as humans, to reconstitute our relationship with nature. There are three core principles of rewilding. One, to reintroduce what conservationists consider natural conditions. For example, keystone species, which are apex predators like wolves and large herbivores like bisons, are being reintroduced in certain areas. Two, to relinquish control of nature. This goes against more traditional conservation practices, which take a management approach to the areas and species they govern. Rewilding is instead centered on a belief that nature takes care of itself. And three, to connect humans to wild nature as a way to promote both human and environmental well being. The group Rewilding Britain gives this further explanation on their website. Rewilding is the large scale restoration of ecosystems to the point where nature can take care of itself. It seeks to reinstate natural processes and where appropriate, and when the time is right, reintroduce missing species, allowing them to shape the landscape and its habitats. Rewilding offers hope and the opportunity to give nature and us a fighting chance, bringing it back to life, saving wildlife, tackling climate breakdown and benefiting people and communities. It's about moving from nature protection to recovery and restoration. So we can hear, I think, the repetition of the prefix re, and all of this language suggests a reaching backward in time in order to construct a future. This is a model of temporality that constructs futurity, that is the, the conceptualization of possible futures by literally reconstructing a past. Rewilding, I think, proposes presupposes two things. First, that there was once a wild that can be brought back, and second, that that wild has or had something to do with us. Even though rewilding is supposed to be about humans letting go of control, at its heart, it has to do with our categorizations of beings and of space. It's inextricable from the way we imagine the past and future of ourselves on this planet. It is, just like Project Tiger itself, a human storying of our involvement with nature a nature that is somehow outside of and separate from us. In the Indian context, rewilding efforts have a slightly different emphasis. The organization Rewilding India, in its mission statement, repeats roughly the same principles, with the crucial additional goals of supporting local communities and revitalizing local economies. This difference suggests an awareness of the historical injustices committed in the name of conservation and the desire to mitigate their effects. 
but the grassroots capitalist framing here sits uneasily alongside the general principles of rewilding, which try to decenter human interests and priorities. And this tension, in my mind, highlights the histories and present inequalities that go unacknowledged in the language of Global North rewilding projects. I'm interested in the project of rewilding the Sunderbunds for a couple of reasons. First is the idea that this landscape is iconically wild, as I've discussed, and also in need of rewilding. And this tension exposes the disjuncture between the idea of the wild and its materiality. Second is the fact that in the Sunderbunds, the interests of human and wild are not necessarily seamlessly entwined, as the Global North rewilding discourse suggests. Rather, they may even be seen to be directly opposed. Humans in the Sunderbunds have an interest in their own survival. Tigers in the Sunderbunds are famously man-eating. The Sunderbunds then test the limit of the idea of rewilding, and unsurprisingly, the discourse becomes unstable. The rewilding of the Sunderbunds has thus ta far taken the form of two major projects, the restoration of the mangrove forests and the reintroduction of the critically endangered Northern River Terrapin. So over the past 30 years, the Sunderbunds has lost roughly a quarter of its mangrove forest. This loss has been fueled by the rise in sea levels and the increased water salinity that has accompanied it by more extreme weather and by growing human encroachment. In a vicious cycle, the decrease in mangrove cover has left the Sunderbunds more vulnerable to the same rising sea salinity and storms and has therefore intensified the vulnerability of all of the region's living populations, including humans. As a result, one rewilding project in the region has taken the form of putting the mangroves back as a form of storm and flood resistance. So in addition to the kinds of mud embankments and concrete embankments that Mengma discussed this morning, we see this planting of mangroves. So this effort is framed as rewilding, but importantly, it isn't really about letting nature heal itself as most rewilding discourse emphasizes. The mangroves are germinated in nursery beds sometimes even in plastic bags, like grow bags, uh, by local women, and then planted on once they're strong enough to withstand the harsh conditions of their habitat. They're planted in lines along mud embankments, like barricades against the force of the tides. So this process takes the scientific view of the purpose or function of the mangrove forest and implements a strategy to help it um, fulfill that purpose. So it is, in fact, the opposite of this figure of wildness, the sort of dense, tang dense, ungovernable tangle that Gauche represents. And yet this project falls under the rubric of rewilding. Additionally, interesting is the population who, in the main, performs this work of nurturing and then planting the mangroves. It's done by the women known as tiger widows, whom, whom uh, Magna also discussed. Uh, women who've lost their husbands to tiger attacks and are one of the most impoverished groups in the region. So it's important to note that not all of the planting work is paid. A lot of it is, all, is done on a volunteer basis. In this way, the tigers of the Sunderbunds re-enter this discussion of rewilding. They're represented here through human beings who've been economically disenfranchised by their wildness, by their unusual, unpredictable, ungovernably violent behavior. And to say that I realize that the disenfranchisement is not only economic, but that's the way it's framed in the discourse around this project. The other flagship rewilding project in the Sunderbunds is the reintroduction of the Northern River Terrapin, which is extinct across much of its former range in Southeast Asia due to hunting, egg consumption, and illegal trade. Species reintroduction is often a central goal of rewilding efforts. And we've witnessed successes such as the Yellowstone wolves and Scottish beavers as key stepping stones in ecological restoration. These animals come to represent the restoration of wildness itself. Following a similar project in the Bangladesh Sundarbans, the Northern River Terrapin was reintroduced to the Indian Sundarbans in January of 2022. In a collaboration between the Sunderbunds Tiger Reserve and the Turtle Survival Alliance, 10 captive bred terrapins were released into the wild. The 10 turtles were fitted with acoustic trackers, which you can see in the image there, 
So researchers could see that within a month of release, they had spread over 3,500 square kilometers. Starting in 2025, there's a plan to release 1,000 turtles each year. So is the rewilded turtle then to be the new face or figure of conservation in the Sunderbunds or the replanted mangrove? It seems to me that in recent discourse about conservation in the region, where once the tiger was positioned as central, it's now being minimized. Despite many different attempts to prevent it, tiger-human conflict in the region is a seemingly intractable problem. The complexity of this problem and the contradictions it exposes may be driving a move away from the charismatic predator model of conservation that was at the root of Project Tiger. We might agree that a turn to a more ecosystem-based conservation that also works to support local, local communities is only for the good. But what happens to the tiger in this new context? In the Hungry Tide, the problem of tiger conservation in the Sunderbunds is displaced onto a grassroots organization yes. called Project Fokir, which resonate, resonates with Project Tiger, um, working to protect, protect river dolphins. So this is a project that's relatively easy to support, ethically speaking, for Gosha's readers, and it doesn't engage with this conundrum of tiger-human violence. In these rewilding projects, mangroves and terrapins take up the place of the tiger, whose challenging bloody wildness is not necessarily something we want to recover and regenerate. Rather, the tiger's mode of wildness is suppressed in a way that seems distinctly not wild. The tiger haunts these conservation projects the way it haunts Gosha's novels, particularly Gun Island. The narrative concerns of Gun Island are like a palimpsest layered over the tigers that populated and drove the action of the hungry tide. As the tigers exit Gosha's fiction, they have also exited the conversation about rewilding the Sunderbunds, but they reappear in the persons of the tiger widows the wounded community of survivors that speak more to the harm done by tigers than the, to the need to protect them. What this shows us is that minimizing the tiger by no means solves the problem of its wildness in the Sunderbunds. It simply displaces it in favor of another story of the wild. The category wild, as it is imagined in conservation discourse, is inadequate to accommodate the tigers of the Sunderbunds. And so they disappear from the narrative re of rewilding, even as their actions are still central to the lived experiences of the inhabitants of the region. While the rewilding projects I've described might seem to be more domesticated than wild, they're planned, enacted, and surveilled by human beings. It seems to me that they're undergirded by our melancholic attachment to wildness. The tenacity of our attachment to the category wild allows us to deny the material circumstances of living together as species. It leads us to create and to respond to simulacra of wild creatures and wild landscapes, like the trapped terrapins and the regimented rows of planted mangroves. It leads us to favor a more palatable figure of the wild and to erase its more difficult materiality. This is why I have trouble with the wild as a mode of imagining futurity. As Halberstam notes, wildness is entangled with human temporality. He argues that the wild, quote, beckons us to a future we know will never come. This image rings true in the discourse of rewilding, I think, and begs the question of whether wildness can be involved in futurity as it actually unfolds. One of our central tasks in the current context of ecological crisis is to reimagine futurity, to forge possible futures when futurity itself can seem an impossibility. A melancholic attachment to the wild thus seems an abdication of this responsibility. Unwilding, by contrast, would ask us to dwell in place and time as material conditions and with other species as living, living beings rather than as figures. In unwilding the tiger, I seek to reimagine it not as an icon or indeed as a project, a thing to be contained, isolated, kept inviolate, but rather to acknowledge its place as a creature among other creatures, all seeking to live in a context of unprecedented endangerment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandhya. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, we'll be coming back to you with 
any questions and um, thoughts. Thank you so much. So before we um, invite questions from the audience, um, I will just quickly attempt to sum up what we've heard today from Sandhya and from Surabhi um, and pick up a few of the main ideas so that we can take those up. Maybe it will facilitate the questions. Um, Sandhya, it was, I, I totally loved how you drew attention to how um, romantic notions almost of an erstwhile wild, which is lost, but which can be brought back inform conservation efforts in contemporary India as well as elsewhere, as well as um, in literary depictions, um, such as the ones that you've talked about today. Um, the other point that you made about uh, reintroducing missing species and how it is misplaced uh, also really resonated because uh, we are witnessing the colossal failure, failure of uh, um, project Cheetah in India, um, as we speak, the results have been totally disastrous in the sense that multiple Cheetahs have died um, as a result of this uh, as, as of this movement of Cheetahs, of uh, uh, importing these Cheetahs uh, in order to uh, uh, sort of reintroduce them as a species in India. Um, the other point that you made about um, conceptualizing possible futures by reconstructing a past um, a past which is uh, mostly imagined um, and the pitfalls of this approach are also things which I believe are not only restricted to uh, the terrain of conservation, they are obviously also connected to broader political measures underway right now um, across the world in multiple countries, uh, primarily where one has a right-wing sort of uh, regime or government in power. We find that these attempts are being made um, and the fallacy of these needs to be pointed out. I found also um, really wonderful how you extended the concept of the wild as an imaginary sort of uh, uh, category uh, beyond the tiger to embrace also the terrapins, which uh, are now being rewilded or the attempt to rewild them is being made, the dolphins, but also the mangroves. So uh, really underlining the point that uh, it is a multi-species world and um, uh, the wild is also in that sense extended beyond one species, uh, beyond the non-human also to the human. Um, I was also reading Anu Jales's uh, work um, where she makes, um, where she talks about a certain jati hierarchy, which exists in the Sundarbans with the Midnapuris, the East Bengalis, the Muslims and the Adivasis. And uh, the Adivasis are, of course, placed at the very bottom of this uh, hierarchical pyramid. And um, the other Jatis tend to see them as primitive people. And uh, the history, of course, goes uh, further back uh, because uh, British colonial authorities also considered people, tribal people living in the forest as wild and savage. So we find that, of course, the wild is not something reserved only for the tigers here in the uh, popular construction of um, uh, the tigers of Sundarbans, but also for a, uh, for a large number of uh, the inhabitants of the Sundarbans. As, um, um, so uh, tribals or Adivasis as people who are wild or savage and needed to be settled and civilized. Um, uh, we find also that the tiger widows that you mentioned today um, the vast majority of them are Adivasis. And uh, that made me wonder because um, you did talk about how the category of the wild becomes a fortress for the tigers of the Sundarbans, um, or one could think of it almost as a prison for the, for the tigers of the Sundarbans. Would you say that this consequence applies also to the subaltern humans that are there and um, who are likewise construed as wild? Um, and the second question that I wanted to ask you very quickly was something that had come up uh, in our first session today. Um, so Anu had uh, spoken about possible reasons for why the tigers of Sundarbans are um, man-eaters or man-killers. Um, and she said one of the reasons could be, uh, uh, you know, this idea that tigers, the Sundarban tigers, succumb to greed just like humans. And uh, this greed is what makes them attack humans. Um, or she also said um, that it's because of the tides and how um, uh, the tides mark a wash out or wash away the territorial markings that the tigers leave behind. 
and this tends to make them more aggressive towards humans. I would like to know your thoughts on this because you did mention in your talk that there are multiple theories um, and I was wondering which of these you uh, subscribe to. And um, for uh, Surabhi, I'll also go ahead and then we'll come to your responses. Um, you've, you've shown pretty clearly in your paper how um, tigers and other charismatic uh, megafauna can be seen as simultaneously kin and stranger uh, or neither totally alien nor intimately familiar as uh, Kedar Nath Singh has so wonderfully done in Bach. Um, you also discussed how anthropomorphism can be a productive approach to non-human animals and how anthropomorphic cultural identifications need not necessarily translate into an anthropocentric approach if one, um, like Kedarnath Singh, treads a consciously charted middle path between using animals symbolically to stand in for human subjects, which is uh, mostly the case in literary texts, and the other extreme of leaving out animal sentience or uh, the animal as animal altogether to avoid assuming too much. I would like to know your thoughts um, on the limits or rather limitations of anthropomorphism as a way of approaching and engaging with non-human animals, given that a really wide variety of animals are never anthropomorphized. Um, creatures who we don't typically recognize as being like us in any possible way or us being like them in any possible way, especially non-charismatic animals like uh, insects primarily, but also many others um, which make up a whopping part of our planet's biodiversity, but which, uh, uh, which are not represented, which are not written about, which are not accepted in the way... Um, the more charismatic species are, um, or the, the companion species are. And you'd mentioned Uday Prakash, and uh, I'm glad you did, because he's, uh, uh, his his short story, Tirich, does precisely that. It has, uh, you know, this uh, sort of poisonous lizard. Um, it's presented. It is not anthropomorphized. The otherness is felt. But at the same time, it is a part of the... Um, uh, of the of the uh, of the ecosphere of the text, so to speak. So it's it's an alien presence, but not um, so alien that one cannot deal with it in the narrative. However, the approach is very different from the way uh, one would tend to write about other kinds of animals. So I'd like you to comment on that, please. Sandhya, would you like to go first? Can I go first? It should, um... Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, so I do think that there are limits to anthropomorphism, like you said, and uh, charismatic species and companion species uh, are obviously favored more when it comes to representation uh, and how we, how we relate to them and how we think about them and microbes, insects, others are left behind somehow. So I think here is where, uh, if I speak from a literary point of view, uh, here is where the writer's job begins because I've seen writers write about butterflies, monarch butterflies, um, like Barbara King Solver does in Flight Behavior or Jeff Vandermeer writes in the Annihilation Trilogy. He, he writes about mushrooms or uh, microbes and fungus, which are uh, neither completely plant nor completely animal. And uh, he writes about them and how they contaminate us with alterity, right? So uh, I think it, it depends on the, uh, the 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 job of the writer and how they present that particular world to us, and which is why there's there are lots of studies in narratology and narrative strategies to bring together to bring uh, the animal world into the in, in on the core of the. How do you represent alterity in itself is the question that cannot be completely answered. And uh, that that it has to be somehow lie in the space of literature is something we can all agree on. But uh, you cannot completely uh, represent alterity. You cannot completely represent uh, radical otherness in literature. 
there would be something that would forever be left that is not represented. So I I do think that uh, there are limits to anthropomorphism and uh, other animals which do not get uh, like elephants and uh, tigers. They are of course the charismatic megafauna. They are easier to get behind uh, when it comes to conservation. When it comes to uh, rallying about for them, but uh, it it takes a lot to imagine yourself in the shoes of the virus, for example, the coronavirus, or to think of, um, uh, or to think of the microbe or the, or or, or the snail, for example, right? So yeah. Thank you, um, Sudhibi. That makes sense. That makes perfect sense. And um, I I do think of anthropomorphism as a very viable strategy. And uh, even though literature might have um, limits to, uh, to to the extent to which it can capture alterity. I still think it has a, a greater field of possibility than do other sort of methodological approaches. Because here, of course, imagination plays a role. The subject subjective comes into play much more than in other forms of inquiry. So yeah, very, very um, helpful. Sandhya, were you there when uh, I asked you uh, the questions? Yes, I was. Sorry. And, the, and then my Zoom crashed. So apologies <laughs> for that. Um, thank you for those really interesting questions. Um, so as to the the question of the idea of wildness as it's applied across uh, species in the Sundarbans and, and elsewhere, right? There's been a lot of work on this, but and the wildness of Adivasi peoples, for example, I think absolutely. And this is sort of part of the point that I'm making um, that you know, for Jack Halberstam thinks that there's something to sort of um, recuperate out of that idea of the wild that can be, that can be empowering, right? Or, or um, that it's the, it's the terrain of anti-colonial forces or, or disenfranchised peoples. But to my mind, he doesn't do enough to sort of explain how we can detach <laughs> what is his idea of the wild from wildness as, as it has been constructed, right? So these people are wild and they either need to be contained or or these beings are wild, they either need to be contained in a protective kind of fortress or they need to be civilized, right? Or, they, or, or both, they need to be contained and civilized. And in so doing, we can displace them and we can take their land and we, and we can remove their um, modes of subsistence and their epistemes and that kind of thing, right? So I think absolutely it's a category that has been historically applied across across species and very much to sections of of humanity in order to um to dehumanize quite basically right or to create the kinds of hierarchies that you and Anujale have have discussed um and this is sort of part of why i have questions about using wildness as a mode of imagining futurity right because it carries with it this kind of hierarchy um, as to the question of why do I think the tigers uh, attack humans? Now, I am a literary scholar, so so I could not tell you. I've heard these theories, right? So the, so the water salinity, the tide, obviously the the prey are, are you know, the populations of prey, prey animals are decreasing um, along with climate change and this and and um, and the the destruction of the forest so those are all possible reasons but what i can tell you from my point of view is is how much symbolic currency is comes out of of these facts about the landscape and we we can see it in gosha's work but even if you read sort of a popular science article about the sundarbans or like a um um a conservationist's work or paper you see this investment in in the sort of exotic and unusual nature of the ecosystem right that it that it it creates the conditions for this kind of strange eruptive violent wildness and the idea of you know gauche represents it as, as a landscape that is fundamentally and troublingly unstable because the land is never there right it's there and then it disappears and it's there and it disappears um and and even the efforts to 
uh, solve the tiger problem are so um, uh, symbolic in their way. Like the, um, what Anu was talking about earlier, the, the masks on the back of the head. I mean, who knows if that would even work, but the idea that a tiger needs to look you in the, needs to attack you from the back. And if they look you in the face, there might be some kind of communication, right? That they won't attack you um, or the sweetening of the water. I think there's just so much investment in how we interpret the landscape and the Sundarbans tiger in particular as this as this sort of very unique, uh, unusual, anomalous figure. Yeah, it's interesting because I was listening to a talk by Nayani Gamathur once where she was discussing uh, Phuket cats and uh, um, one of the points that she made was how people in um, Uttarakhand usually said that if you come across a big cat in the forest and you meet the gaze of the cat, then you won't be attacked. And this is the exact opposite of what people elsewhere would tell you. You know, do not meet the gaze because the big cat will think of it as a challenge and therefore, you know, uh, get away from that. So it's also somehow uh, other local cosmologies and elements do seem to play a role, of course, in how um, tigers are construed, how they are understood, how they are responded to. Very fascinating. Thank you. Susan, you have a question. Go ahead. Yeah, I have a question for the both of you. Um, I noticed that both the talks have a kind of implicit emphasis on a uh, critical realist interpretation of Tiger. So against rewilding as something that promotes a kind of exotic representation of Tiger or nature, or when should be highlighted the uh, importance of the real and the alive tiger in the poem. So just from the perspective of uh, maybe uh, mimesis, I was thinking about how uh, would you say that uh, realistically representing a tiger or the animal is important to do? Uh, should I go ahead? Um... I think, um, and what we saw of the poem uh, is really fascinating because it, it isn't a realist, right? And so I think um, I might draw a distinction between the the stylistics or the form of realism and, and what I think we were both talking about, which is the sort of uh, material life of the tiger, right? So I don't, I don't think that realism is the only mode in which you can or should represent animals in literature, and nor do I necessarily think it's even the best one to use, um, because realism as a form is is very much implicated with the kinds of of, of structures that we've been talking about throughout. Right, um, it's implicated with a certain uh, world view that might be invested in in um, ideas about wildness, for example. Um, but I think the distinction to be drawn is what we've seen, what all the talks have shown, is the disjuncture between Project Tiger as um, a project that is sort of realist in its framing, right? But that, but that falls some way short of actually accounting for the realities of material life, whether that's the material lives of, of the tigers themselves um, or of the populations that surround the reserves or the populations of other non-humans within the reserves, right? So I think that would be more what I was getting at rather than suggesting that that realism is the, the superior mode of representation or attempting to sort of capture something realistic or mimetic about the tiger in literature. Uh, that's not at all <laughs> what I'm saying in terms of literary form, but rather about the disjuncture between the way we story uh, space and animals, uh, which could very well be in a, in a realist form, um, and uh, their lived experience not as figures, right? Figures of, of wildness or power or whatever, but as um, actual creatures. Um, yeah. So I would like to make a distinction between uh, the mode of representation, not to you, but the question that Susan asked. Um, 
between the mode of representation and the politics of representation. So even if uh, something which is realistic, uh, or something which which uh, lies in the realist mode, so to speak, can have politics, like you said, can have politics of representation, which does not align with a very uh, anti anthropocentric viewpoint, right? So uh, I do not think that re uh, realism is something which is the best suited to uh, uh, the best suited vehicle for uh, representing animals, but rather the politics of this representation matters in no matter which form or which mode it comes in. So we have uh, Kafka talking about the ape, and uh, there have been many critical uh, studies of that particular kind of uh, fable. The fable that has been written, which is not a realist fable, it's rather uh, it's, it's a fable. I mean, <laughs> so uh, it would not translate into anthropocentric meaning, like I said, but rather, uh, uh, but rather the politics or the ideology behind the writing matters. It's not just the mode that matters. Is what I feel. Thank you, Suribi. Uh, Sandhya, I would like to uh, just mention a little something else from your talk, which um, which I was quite struck by. Um, it was actually from um, the extract that you gave from The Hungry Tide, where there was this sentence, I have noted it down, the forest's determination to destroy or expel humans. Uh, and it's... It's really powerful because it gives us a certain image of the forest as this uh, hostile, um, powerful, mysterious um, force um, as a being in itself almost uh, with, with, with its own agency and as a source of threat. And I think that kind of sets the stage really for the events that unfold in the Hungry Tide. And uh, because the text was so widely successful and um, informed a lot of what people wrote, scholars wrote, and how they learned to read these texts. Uh, I think it has also had this very profound impact. So I'm really glad that you uh, brought that portion of the text along for us today. Um, and I wonder how you read the forest in the, in the Hungry Tide. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that you pick up on that because there is something about You know, <laughs> excuse me. I think the book as a whole is very interested in um, taking down his sort of cosmopolitan protagonists a peg, right? And and sort of showing the points at which their um, self satisfaction and kind of superiority uh, get get challenged. And that's not in order to to break them down, but in order to make them better. Right to transform them, um, and this is sort of part part of the problem is that the the oh, the whole context of the Sundarbans from the animals to the mangroves to the people are there in order to affect this transformation in these sort of urban cosmopolitan characters and make them better and more 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 environmentally conscious and more you know into the development of the region. So it's obviously to represent the landscape as this sort of inhuman place right that is that is not um not only non-human but also actively trying to to harm you um is part of this part of creating this kind of surroundedness by the wild for for his characters right um and i think I think you see that a lot. It's it's a it's a trope, isn't it? That you put your characters into a landscape that is that is going to challenge and threaten them in order to have them overcome. Um, and and you know, so I think that's a trope that he's taking up with this great specificity. And the kind of difficulty with these novels, although especially the Hungry Tide, I think because it was more successful, I think um, is my impression. But who knows? Um, is that he, he takes up these subjects that are very interesting and then becomes the sort of main representation of it, right? Um, 
uh, Dominic and I were talking about this before we began today, but that, you know, this is a very dominant idea of what the the Sundarbans are and what, you know, and so it, it then become, it takes on an extra weight, right, that, that this book is the, sort of the dominant representation of it. Um, because there isn't that sort of diversity yet of, of representations. Um, but I think the the contrast between what we see in the rewilding of the forest and how Gauche is representing the mangroves is very interesting, right? Because there's nothing, you know, first of all, the idea that the mangroves are this barrier, right? This protective barrier is a totally different representation also the idea that it's very chaotic right and it's very it's dense and chaotic and threatening whereas the way that the mangroves are being rewilded is, is being planted in these these rows to create this this wall um it couldn't be more different really a, as an image and so we have these two sort of contrasting ideas of what the wildness of that region is or can be Thank you. I have often thought of the Hungry Died as a kind of a Bildungsroman for the Anthropocene. So, yeah, it's interesting to uh, to listen to what you just said. Dominic, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, I kind of wanted to pick up on that, really, um, that one of the things that um, Sanjay's paper does really well is kind of think through the the simultaneity of the non-simultaneous of conservation insofar as we have it sometimes when you read the kind of like political ecology and sociology literature and conservation you can come away with um sometimes a bit of an idea that there's been a, a, a these stages or waves of conservation history um which maybe at a macro level is true but at a localized level uh and a granular level they all sort of con like exist together and rub up against each other in various ways so you know fortress conservation never really gave way to community conservation but the two basically coexisted in a kind of horrible alliance forever and ever in the past 30 40 years and i think that the the, the concept of the wild really helps us access that from a new angle um so uh, yeah the, the sort of deconstruction of the world i should say so basically my, my question is picking up on that discussion around around gauche and i think that if if we think that if we think that um thinking back to Sudavasan's uh, amazing point um like simple but effective right point last week which is that the charismatic tiger is like not just emulated and emblematized but reworked and reiterated through the project tiger initiative itself right and then within that we might think that somehow the Sundarbans itself becomes within the kind of literary atmosphere of Gauche's text itself this kind of charismatic setting for all of these dramas to play out within the within representational form but I think that zooming out from the text if we think that like you know 2002 2003 2004 when it comes out is basically this like high point of a kind of um community-based conservation at its height right then I wonder what sort of symptomatic reading we might do of Gun Island, published 15 years later. So if if in 2004, the text kind of feels like it's calling for this reconciliation of the local and the global, this mediation of cosmopolitanism with um, like subalternity, then what, what, what really is Gun Island like negotiating what sort of contemporary concerns might we zoom out from and say, oh yeah, this is what's going on here. And I feel like Sundia will, will have a, a good, a really good answer to this question. I mean, I don't know. It's, it's a very interesting question, right? Because it does seem to, it, it goes back to the location and you see Pia, the marine biologist, and she's still there running her project. And so that community based, um, based uh, conservation is still there, right? So it's, she's sort of basically so shown as having been reasonably successful at, at doing exactly what you said, right? But then at the same time, the main preoccupation when it comes to the Sundarbans there is, is to show that it, it is a global place, 
right? That it has connections to these global flows of commerce, especially there's an obsession with the with the commercial history of the Sunderbunds as being entwined with the natural history of the Sunderbunds, right? At, at one point, one of the characters described it as the place where nature and commerce face off, <laughs> something like, I think, I think that's, it's, it's, a, it's a, that kind of image. Anyway, um, so, so tracing these, as he sort of did in, in his other works between the two books, tracing global flows becomes the main uh, focus. So he has this, the background of this kind of um, folklore story. Um, and then he's tracing it across to Italy at the same time that these refugees are coming into Italy and, and you know, he's sort of documenting the, the European refugee crisis. Right. Um, so it's it's not about conservation anymore. Right. And it has sort of abandoned that image of cons it's still going on there. It's still like important, but it's not it's it's almost at a larger scale unimportant. Right. It's sort of so it, it's almost the opposite of what he does in The Hungry Tide. In The Hungry Tide, he takes these people who have all kinds of global connections and brings them into this place to show them why their global connections are not good enough without the, the local connections, right? And so then that's very transformative for them and they are enriched and, and whatever it, it, it translates into this project. But then in, in Gun Island, what we have is this character who sort of gets a bit from the Sunderbonds and then he travels around and goes to Italy and and the setting of and and it's very invested in showing that there are people from the Sunderbunds in Venice right and have been like historically and that they kind of belong there as a long-standing population so it's more about this kind of these kinds of global flows and the the conservation in Venice is more about the architecture right so it's it's about how climate change is destroying this incredible architecture, this incredible human created edifice and, and you know, what a tragedy that is. So it's a very interesting shift. And I think that's a great question is, you know, he seems to be picking up on the moments that he's written the, these books um, and, and what sort of movements in conservation can we trace and the difference between them, I think is, yeah, I think it's really interesting. So we have a couple of questions in the chat as well. Uh, one from Pranav Menon, I think, is directed to you, Sandhya. We'll start with that. Um, so Pranav writes, wildness and rewilding as forms of realism and representation also somewhere falls into the dialectic, where the wild is merely perceived as a gaze for the civilized, as we see in tiger reserves. Is there a way to then see the politics of wildness and gaze being transposed onto humans who are dependent on these landscapes as well. Doesn't the ontological turn vis-a-vis non-human also imply moving beyond binaries of wild, non-wild in how politics is negotiated on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, in brief. Um, yes, and so that's that's kind of the point that I was trying to make that, that um, while that the wild is something or the wild is something that always is set against the not wild and this idea about civilization or or tameness or or whatever opposition we want to set up there and that's why i don't i question its sort of value as a way of imagining a, a future right <laughs> or any kind of future that we can negotiate in the context of of, of climate change and ecological catastrophe um I have I, I question whether wildness, whether our attachment to wildness, right, this this very deep attachment to it is is going to serve our 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 ability to construct that that future, right? So I think that's that's exactly right, right? That wildness has historically been, as as we said, a, a, a category that is imposed in order to contain, right, in in many different ways um, or control. Um, and uh, and so yes, I think that we should we we do need to move beyond the binary of of wild non wild, um, absolutely. 
And then we have a question from Rehan. Um, I think it's probably for Surabhi, but uh, both can go ahead and respond. Uh, Rehan writes, thank you for such an excellent session. Is not it that the human is the center in anthropomorphism? Could you please tell some more limitations of anthropomorphism? What are the other viable ways of engaging non-human animals apart from anthropomorphism? Surupi, would you like to take that up? Uh, sure. Uh, limitations of anthropomorphism, I would say uh, mainly uh, it is to serve a purpose, mostly a didactic moral purpose when it comes to fables and when it comes to stories like Panchatantra. Uh, so the animal becomes a puppet for the writer's vision rather than a, a, a person or, a, or not a person, I shouldn't say a person, but rather a subject in its own right. So uh, anthropomorphism very, very uh, clearly mentions that, uh, not mentions, but rather uh, dictates how we see animals and, and animals which we, we cannot completely, which do not completely vanish from our vision, but are there and somehow disappearing as um, uh, 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 disappearing in the vision, but also somehow present in our vision, but also disappearing from our vision because they are disappearing from the world, vanishing from the world. But at the same time, they are also present anthrop anthropomorphically in cartoons, in films, in um, in in different kinds of um, media, which which presents a technological echo of the animal rather than the animal itself, rather than the animal in materiality, rather than the animal which is alive and real, like Vedana himself. So, uh, in that sense, anthropomorphism is a completely uh, it it does fall short. But like I said, that in Kedarna Singh's Bagh, especially what he does is that he does not just mythologize the idea of survival, uh, the idea of man-animal conflict, but he also mythologizes the idea of man-animal coexistence. And this is how human beings have related to animals through time, uh, uh, through time, through through historicity, uh, through fables, through myths. So it cannot entirely be something which we we can eschew. Like for example, the hungry tiger, like Sandra talked about on uh, uh, the previous sessions as well. The myth of Bond baby is something which is um, at the forefront of animism and the forefront of uh, Amitabh Ghosh's uh, many preoccupations. Right. So uh, in that sense, animism and uh, mythology and uh, anthropomorphism feed into each other and cannot entirely be eschewed from our imagination of animals and of, from our imagination uh, uh, that we exercise when we think ourselves in the beings of animals, right? So uh, there are multiple ways to think, I think, and all of them complement each other, even when they uh, may not uh, be successful in all the right respects, but they complement each other in different ways. So you have the realist tradition, you have the naturalist tradition, you might have, you might uh, think anthropomorphism is doing a certain thing, but like I said, Kafka um, in uh, the report to an academy uh, does something very different. You might think that he's talking about Jewish people, but at the same time, he's talking about the ape, right? Um, so yeah, I would say that it depends on the uh, story that is being told. Sandhya, would you like to add to that? No, I think I think that's a, a great answer. It's always the trap, isn't it? That you know we can't get away from anthropomorphism um, <laughs> ever, but but because it's it's so deeply ingrained in our forms. What I, what I would say is I think that um, what I have sort of thought about anthropomorphism is uh, in degrees of exploitation, right? That in our arts. Uh, as in our material lives for food or clothing or or companionship or you know um anthropomorphism is another way that that human culture exploits animals right so puts this sort of symbolic weight onto animals the didactic thing that that um Sarabi was talking about um so i think it's not necessary i i think writers and artists uh, have all done all kinds, filmmakers have done all kinds of um, interesting formal experimental work to try to get away from anthropomorphism within 
their own human art forms. But I think it's it's more about reading practices, right, and interpretive imp interpretive frames um, that recognizing that sort of use that's being made of animals rather than trying to get rid of anthropomorphism altogether. Yeah, I mean, um, we talk about how, um, I mean, this is something I do in class all the time because we um, tend to pick up texts in which there are animals and we kind of try to read against the grain to show the students that that's possible because they're so steeped in the tradition of reading animals as metaphors that it takes some time breaking away from that habit. And uh, something that we always talk about is, you know, this idea of uh, uh, what is it like to be a bat? And I can never know what it is like to be a bat, but I can imagine. And if uh, if an anthropomorphic approach enables me to approach the bat a little bit, um, as long as I'm of, as long as I'm aware of the fact that this is anthropomorphism. So, in other words, something like a more self-aware or a reflected kind of anthropomorphism, instead of the naive version, which is the one that is then problematic so much more. Um, that's usually how I try to find my way out of the conundrum <laughs> to anthropomorphize or not. Yeah. But um, thank you so much. This is about all we have time for today. Um, thank you really again, Sandhya and Surubi, for these um, absolutely exciting thoughts that you've shared with us today. Thank you, everyone, who made the time to be here for your questions, your comments. Um, I really had a great time, and I'm sure all of you did as well. Uh, we will be back on the 15th of December with the two final sessions um, of this conference and we look forward to seeing you there. Bye-bye.